Hey everyone, welcome to Data Umbrellas webinar. I'm going to do a brief introduction and then Alex will do his presentation. And if you have any questions along the way, uh, please put them in the chat and we'll make sure to get them um, answered uh, at the end after uh, Alex has finished presenting. This is being recorded and will be on our YouTube within a couple of days. A little bit about Data Umbrella. We are a community for underrepresented persons in data science. We organize events around data science and we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, this is a, a photo of um, our team members that make it happen either here or behind the scenes. We have a code of conduct and we thank you for helping to make this a welcoming, friendly community for everyone. Uh, there are various ways that you can support Data Umbrella. The first and foremost is to follow our code of conduct. Uh, another way you can participate is to join our Discord. The link to Discord is on our website. Another way that you can support Data Umbrella is to donate to our nonprofit. We are an open collective at Data Umbrella. And if you work for a company that uses Benevity, uh, they will match dollar for dollar any donation that you make. Um, we have quite a library of presentations on open source and data science on YouTube. We're about to hit 2,000 subscribers this week, probably. And we are on YouTube, uh, Data Umbrella. Uh, and I'll share the link in the chat as well. We have a bunch of playlists. One of them is on career advice. Uh, we have data visualization, one for beginners, a lot of videos on contributing to open source, particularly scikit-learn, PyMC, and NumPy. We have a monthly newsletter, which is dataumbrella.substack.com. We aim to get one newsletter out um, per month, and we do not share your email address with anybody, so no need to worry about spam. Our website has a lot of resources on conferences, open source, accessibility. We encourage you to check that out on your own. We are on all social media platforms as Data Umbrella. The ones that are highlighted, such as Twitter and LinkedIn, are the most active. Meetup is the place to go to find out about upcoming events. It's where we post all of our events in the first place. And uh, we have a blog, too, blog.dataumbrella.org. We use Big Marker for this webinar platform, and so there is live captioning available. So if you go to the very top, there are two letters CC for closed captioning, and you can select English um, or whatever language. I have heard that English is the best transcription. There is some translation. I think it's not the best in other languages, but it is available. Uh, we are looking for volunteers. We do timestamps for all of our videos, and one of the reasons we do timestamps is that it makes it easier for viewers to get to the part of the video that they're interested in, and also it helps viewers find the video based on their search terms, and I'll share a link to that in the chat as well. Our upcoming events is next Tuesday um, on October 25th. We are having Bioimage Data Analysis Workflow with Scikit-Image, and that's with Marianne Korvalek. And on November 15th, we're having an intro to Rust event. Apparently, Rust is super, super popular these days. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, today's talk is with Alex de Siquiera. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but Alex will say his name soon. And it's an overview of 3D image processing using scikit-image. A little bit about Alex. Alex is a researcher working with outreach and programming on data science and computer vision. He is a maintainer of Scikit-Image, a collection of algorithms for image processing that is part of the scientific Python ecosystem. Alex is an open source and free software enthusiast since his first interaction with Linux in the 2000s contributed to several projects and events worldwide. And you can find Alex on LinkedIn, Twitter, and GitHub, all one word, Alex de Siquiera. Um, if you'd like to tweet about this event, Data Umbrella is on Twitter, at Data Umbrella, one word. And so with that, I am going to uh, mute my microphone and remove my slides and hand it over to Alex. Thanks, Reshma. Hey, everyone. Uh, this is me. This is Alex. Let's, uh, let's share my screen. Sharing on. Um, how do I do that? Switch screen. Entire screen. Yes. Allow. I hope you can see my screen right now. Uh, I will 
Can you give me a thumbs up if you see my screen here at the chat? Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you, Reshma. So, hey everyone, um, Reshma did all the deeds, but I'm Alex. Um, I am working at Fio Cruz right now here in Brazil. Uh, I am a maintainer uh, at Psychic Image since 2016, I guess, in 2015, 2016. And um, I'd like to talk about 3D image analysis and using Psychic Image today with y'all. Um, here we'll see how we analyze three dimensional stacked and volumetric images with Python, mainly using Psychic Image and some packages from the scientific Python ecosystem. And we will pre-process some data. We will inspect, count, and measure some attributes in this data and visualize a visualized large 3D data. But there's a catch in that. And you'll see when the time comes. Um, first, what is Psychic Image? Uh, I have a nice tale about that. When we, um, I had an idea for a book on image processing and Psychic Image, and I submitted to, submitted it to O'Reilly a while ago, and uh, their re representative said to me, hey, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Alex, but we have several books on Psychic Learn already, you know, so a lot of people um, uh, misunderstand us with Psychic Learn by some reason, for some reason, um, but we are, a scikit aimed for image processing, and we can interact with scikit-learn, we can interact with scipy packages, we can interact with numpy packages, and the whole scientific Python ecosystem. And why is that? Because the basis of scikit-image are numpy, uh, numpy arrays. So everything, uh, every place where you can fit a numpy array and work with a numpy array, you can use Psychic Image images in that too. Um, so I I had some uh, some tests in here where you can uh, you can use these tests to see if your if your system is ready to run this tutorial. Um, but it will be more or less like an overview, and um, it will be there at the um, at the uh, chat for you all to like to download it and to download the data that comes with it too, okay? So for us, uh, for us to start, let's import numpy, matplotlib, and scipy.nd image. Um, so numpy, scipy, and matplotlib are the, uh, the, uh, the fundamental, the core packages for the whole scientific Python ecosystem, right? So you see that I'm using here numpy, uh, matplotlib, and from scipy, we're importing nd image, and then we can call these packages like that. And so the uh, the basic Jupiter, Jupiter magic like uh, percent matplotlib in line, so the uh, the plots will appear all uh, all inside the uh, the notebook. Um, I like monospace fonts everywhere, so I will put these as a uh, I will set up my my plots in this talk as a monospace font. Um, so this is what these do like plt.rcprams and then font.family is equal to monospace. Um, and then let's go to images, of course. Um, in second image, as I said, so images are numpy arrays and a grayscale image, like a single channel image is a two dimensional matrix of pixels, right? So every pixel will be an intensity intensity of, uh, of grayscale, like of, of illumination of light so if you see this as a, a 2D matrix, the first component will be a row and the second one, like a rows, and the second one will be the columns, right? So if you're working with multi-channel data, you will have an extra dimension, which is called channel for us. And in most, uh, in most cases, this data is in the final position. So we would have like row, column, and then channel as the final um, as the final dimension in these images. So thinking on that, we can construct a three-dimensional volume as a series of 2D planes, right? So you have several planes, two-dimensional planes with their rows and columns. And then when we get them all together, we'll have a three-dimensional image. And the shape that we use for that in second image is plane in the first coordinate and then row in the second one and column in the third one. 
So if we want to summarize that, so 2D grayscale will have row and column. 3D grayscale will have plane, row, and column. And for the uh, multi-channel images, they're more or less like the same, but they will have a less coordinate that will uh, that will be called channel because it's the channels of the image, okay? So some 3D images, they're constructed, they're built with equal resolution in each dimension. Uh, so let's say we can render a sphere with dimensions 30 planes, 30 rows, and 30 columns. But like in the wild, in real life, images are not like that. So uh, if, you're photo, uh, if you're taking pictures of thin slices, like to approximate a 3D, three-dimensional structure, like a stack of 2D, 2D images, um, these will have a lower resolution. They will be like, they will be more spaced, like in comparison to the uh, row and, uh, to the rows and columns. And we'll work with one example of these in the tutorial. Okay. okay. So for us to start, um, there are several, several images. Uh, there are several modules inside Zekit image. And the first one that we'll, ta uh, we'll talk about today is called IO. So Zekit image.io, which um, has input and output. So lots of, uh, lots of functions, lots of modules to read and write images in several, several formats. So the most common, uh, the most commonly used functions that you will have there are io.imread, io.imsave. So these will read or save an image respectively. And io.imread collection that will read like a bunch of images that have a same common pattern. Okay. So we can load data with io.imread and then for that, we will first like import IO. So from second image, import IO. So the input output sub module. And then we will, uh, we will read this, um, these, this image that's called data slash cells dot These are all in the repository that I, uh, I just put in there at the chat. And we are calling these cells. So every time we refer to as cells in here at this presentation, we'll refer to these data that's like uh, several cells, uh, cute cells matching. Uh, uh, they have um, they have the same colors in the image, and we'll talk. Uh, we'll see these, and we'll talk about these more in the uh, presentation. Okay. So first, we read these like io.im read cells. And then, hey, this is in the variable cells. So first, let's check its shape, its data type, and its range. So where does it, like, the minimum values and the maximum values. So since these are, like, NumPy arrays, so we can use cells.shape, cells.dtype, and cells.min, cells.max, like any NumPy array would, okay? So we can see with cells.shape uh, that the, uh, the shapes are, like, these images have... Uh, this image has 60 planes with 256 rows and 256 columns each, right? So the uh, the data type of these images are, is float, float 64, so 64 bits, 64 bytes in there. Um, and then the range is like from zero to one. So we don't have images that have minus one in them and we don't have images that have like two or three in them too. So they're confined into this interval of zeros and one, zero and one. Okay. Um, so the uh, the main function, the default visualization function, second image is io.imshow, but this function can display only grayscale and RGB like 2D images. So a row and images with rows and columns, or rows, columns, and uh, and channels. But we cannot uh, we cannot use uh, we cannot use it to like to see three D data, but we can use it to visualize two D planes, and we can with that we can build some helping functions for like to check three D data, right? So we um, we are using some functions in here. We're like cheating up a little bit. That but these all these functions are open. You can check this code in supplementary code.py. 
And these functions are the functions that we're using to check everything that's in 3D right now. So they are based on the uh, the 2D image, the 2D functions that we have in second image to show data. Okay. So let's fix this, fix one axis. So we have several planes in there, and let's fix one axis for us to start seeing these images. So we're using plt subplots in here and saying uh, I want one row and three columns. So this is like uh, matplotlib stuff. So we're just saying I want three subplots. And in the first one, I'm using this function that are that that's in there at supplementary code. That's called show plane. So it will show you. Uh, it will show us a two-dimensional plane that we want somewhere, like in this uh, in this cells image. Okay. So show plane in here will show us first the plane number thirty-two, and you can see this here in the left. So these are the cells we were talking about. So we'll have this structure, the three-dimensional structure that shows the cells like that. And then the uh, the middle image in here will show the cells and in the row uh, 128. And it will show uh, the third image here in the right will show you as the, uh, the cells in the column 120, uh, 128. So we can see how these uh, how these cells behave in this plane, in this 3D plane. We could we could uh, try different planes in here or different rows, different columns like go wild, go to town, like um, the world is your oyster. Um, okay, so for 3D-dimensional uh, images, um, they can be viewed as a series of these two-dimensional images. And we have a helper function for that that's called the Slice Explorer. And it will present you a slide in here. Uh, the maximum value here will be the last plane and the minimum value here will be the, the first plane. And in the middle, you can see the cells that are there like with this nice representation in here in the, in the right. OK, so you can check the um, you can check the, 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 the shapes of the uh, the shapes of the cells in the more dynamical way uh, using these um, these slice explorer. OK. Um, and we have another helper function that's called display that will display like 30 planes of this provide uh, of the, the image you provide like every other plane so uh, odd or even planes I don't remember but like hey not this one but this one not this one but this one and so on um, and then here you have some planes that will show us again the uh, the cells in there all right so we saw it we know how it is now let's process it and take some nice, uh, some useful information from that, okay? So first, let's work a little bit on these images to make the, uh, the cells more preeminent, right? So there are, uh, there's a lot of noise in these and maybe we don't want it. We just want the cells, these like nice immaculate big uh, things in there. So we need to first get rid of uh, as more um, as like as much as the noise as we want uh, as we need, and like we um, without like spoiling the images too much, breaking the the uh, the structures too much, and this is an art on itself. For that, we will discuss a little bit of the tools that we can um, that we can use for that, and one of these first. Is like changing, adjusting the uh, contrast of the images, changing the exposure of the images. So for that, in second image, we have a um, a module, a sub, sub sub module that's called exposure, that has several functions for doing that, for adjusting image contrast, contrast and image like uh, um, um, light and so on. And most experimental images they will have something that's called like uh, salt and pepper noise that's like speckles in it you see some like uh, lighter uh, lighter speckles like uh, darker speckles and we can just take these away and improve a lot of our image so first we set up a percentile at like 0 0.5 percent on the uh, on the uh, on the extremes of this image and we can use exposure dot rescale intensity to rescale this in uh, this image 
in the range that we said, like 0.5 and 19.5% of these image, like and getting only what's left in the middle. So with that, we can let, uh, we can take a little bit off and not, um, we can take a little bit of the, um, of the noise off and not break our images too much. Okay. So let's, um, let's follow up with that and say, Hey, um, right now these cells that have these, uh, 0.5% on the, uh, on the margins, they are clipped and we'll use these as cells rescaled because we are rescaling what the, uh, what the lights on this image mean right now. Okay. So now, um, we can use some filters and, um, sharpen the image a little bit, like take, uh, blur the image a little bit. So it depends on the, um, it depends on the, uh, application you have, uh, you, you want something different, right? Um, and in the, uh, in scikit image dot filters at the sub module, we have several functions for to do just that, like sharpen images, blur images, threshold images, find edges, so on, so forth, like several, several filters. Okay. Um, like there we have rank filters in scikit image dot filters dot rank that are nonlinear and they operate on the local histogram according to the image. To take uh, to use these, we will import like scikit image dot, uh, from scikit image. We will import filters, and first um, we will use like Sobel. Since Sobel is two D, we don't have a three D version in scikit image, so we will use like Sobel in each image. Like so, for playing an image in here, in the cells rescaled, like applies the. Uh, the, the Sobo filter for every image we have in these to the image. Okay. And let's see the results using the slice explorer. So you see that the, um, the borders of these image are more pro uh, preeminent, right? Um, and maybe this is useful. Um, but let's see it with more details. So applying some um, applying Sobel, we did apply Sobel and now we're checking it like uh, in this rows and in these columns and seeing how the, uh, how would these images appear right now. And we see that these cells are more preeminent, like, uh, compared to the background. Okay. So now transforms, we have, uh, some functions for transforming data in second image dot transform. And um, we can import this, uh, this sub module using like from second image import transform. And um, right now we can, um, we can down sample some, uh, some of the image. So take some details, like excluding some, uh, some pixels. So for instance, right now uh, in this image, in this example, we have this original image that's eight by eight pixels. And we're downsampling it here, like we're downsampling it here for a two by two image. So we're seeing it right here, uh, right now that we have a pixel for each of these red dots. And right now we, um, and here we have a pixel for each of these dots in the right. So we like in downsampling, we are taking this image and taking off lots of pixels according to some rules that we want like um, depending on their neighbors or depending on the mean value or something like that, you can downsample in several different ways. Um, so we are downsampling it right now, that images according to the, uh, the spacing given by the microscope. So every microscope will give you a space. So we can, uh, we can adjust this image according to the spacing that the microscope gives. So we have a more, um, more faithful, more trustful result, uh, result according to the, uh, the microscope specifications, right? So the uh, microscope gives this original spacing uh, for us, like 0 0.29, 0 0.065 and so on. And 
after normalizing and rescaling the images, we have these normalized spacing of 1.12 uh, and 1 and 1, right? So right now we know that the image is normalized and we can we can um, we can work in a more reliable way and have more reliable results results because we use microscope data on that too, like to give the spacing uh, on these images. Okay, um, so continuing with filters, but first let's talk about the utility functions that we have in Scikit Image. So if we want to convert images like using data types, you don't. Um, you won't convert this directly, like to not like blow up your image somewhere that you don't want. So we have image as something at U2, at the submodule U2. So you can use these to convert from, uh, to convert images to, to floats, so images float, uh, to ints, so images int, to boolean, so images bool, and so on. So U2.invert is very convenient. You just invert an in an image like according to its data type so it won't blow up your image too so random noise so you can uh, you can include some random noise to test some algorithms very useful to um, apply parallel so you can use like desk to apply a function across very uh, to large subsections of an image so if you don't have to, that much memory in your pc and you have like very large images you can use these functions on desk or apply parallel to to take care of these small chunks of the image and uh, get these the large image back in a cohesive way without breaking anything. Um, and then util.pad or and util.crop it will pad and crop the images um, according to some uh, according to some data that you want. If you want to pad with zeros, if you want to pad with mirrors, like you can do whatever you want with these. Um, okay, so from scikit image dot uh, import util, so we have the util submodule, and here I am com uh, converting converting this for like u bytes. So we now have these functions going to like these data going from zero to to fifty five. So uh, u bytes will be um, non signed bytes in here. Uh, so like there's nothing negative in there. Um, and then we will uh, use the median filter to take off more of these noise that we have in there. So again, uh, median the median filter will only uh, operate on 2D images. So if you're passing a 3D image like directly to that, it won't work. So we will like pass these as 2D images. So for plane in cells rescaled like. Uh, filters dot median for that image it will apply everything uh, to uh, image by image 2d by 2d okay uh, and then we convert it back to image as float because the uh, the median uh, the median algorithm that we have in there it will up, uh, it will operate like nicely only in these unsigned bytes images like non-signed byte images um, after applying the medium filter, we can see how is the noise. And if you recall correctly, in the uh, we have lots of noise in here, but it's not that harsh anymore. <laughs> um, and um, right now we have at the uh, the cells parts, it's uh, it's clear. It doesn't have that much noise. Like the noise is larger. It's not. Uh, it's easier for us to take it off with other functions. Okay, so. Um, now we're comparing it, so it's not just Alex talking, right? Uh, you can see the uh, the noise in here, for instance, at the uh, at the side of these uh, at the side of these cells. You can see that's like it's uh, it's almost it's kind of gone in here. If we compare, like uh, in these areas too, like it's something more blurry than what we had in here. So it and it's easier for us to deal with this than with the original image. So right now we're calling it as cells denoised uh, and we'll continue with that. And then like we want to actually extract that these regions right now because we took away a lot of noise already and now we want to see the actual the actual uh, cells. 
So we can use thresholding, which is a hard threshold. It can be a soft threshold, depend on, depends on the uh, algorithms you use. Um, so common, um, common algorithms that you can use are like, for instance, threshold.li and threshold.o2. These are hard thresholds. So you, you will give a value and say, hey, this is my threshold. Like everything up on that is white, everything low on that, like down on that is black. So you you will have by as a result a binary image. Okay. So here we are applying filters dot threshold li and filters dot threshold otsu. And you can compare the results in here and say um like and see that the uh, threshold of uh, li threshold operates a little bit nicer in here because of the uh, it takes all the uh, all the uh, the surfaces of the uh, the cells nicely and it gets the uh, the chunk of it too and here you can see that the li threshold is red and the otsu threshold is blue so uh, otsu will uh, consider more uh, of these of these pixels as black as uh, like we're seeing here like when compared to li Right, so let's continue with Li. And then uh, you see that the, uh, the, the, the noise in the first, the first planes is like, it's totally like, it's almost gone. Let's say they, they will start coming back on uh, plane 20. But now we have something that reminds of, of these cells. And we have something that we can start to analyze but hold on to it. We can improve on that result using the uh, submodule scikit image dot morphology. So morphology like for binary and grayscale images. Right now we have a binary image. Is it black? Is it white? Right, black for background, white white for the uh, for the cells. And to use these functions, we can uh, we can import these uh, submodule with from, from scikit image import morphology. Right. There are two functions in there, two functions in there that I'm very interested in right now that are called, these are called remove small holes and remove small objects. So remove small holes will fill holes inside a region and remove small objects will remove bright regions that are, that are kind of lonely in a dark, uh, in a dark environment. So for instance, the uh, remove small holes will take care of these in here, like these small regions in here. And uh, let me see if I can get a nice one. These in uh, these bright regions in here will be taken care of with remove small objects, okay? So we apply both of them in here. Uh, yeah, first we start with remove small holes. And then you can see that we have, hey, uh, we have a cell. We have uh, we have cells in uh, in the uh, dark background already, and with remove small objects, we will uh, like finish cleaning most of the regions that we have in there, uh, like um, in the side of the cells and so on. Beautiful, we have cells. So right now we can start measuring these regions. We can start labeling these regions saying, hey, this is one cell, this is another cell and so on. And we can start getting area, getting uh, measurements of these functions using the um, scikit image dot measure submodule. So functions that we are interested uh, in. So measure dot label will label images and say like, hey, this is a region and this region is separated from the first uh, and so on. Like it will actually count, like uh, enumerate label regions that we have in the image. And then region prop, uh, region props is a toolbox with several, several, several measures uh, that you can use. Like after you use label, you can take like uh, properties of all of the regions that you, uh, you have in the, um, in these three D, uh, in these two D or three D regions that you have in your, your um, in your image, okay. 
So if you if you want more than that, you can use uh, marching cubes, you can use find contours, you can use mesh mesh surface area uh, comparisons. Like you have everything in there. You have ransack um, ransack fitting and so on and so forth. So for us to use this submodule, like again, from scikit image, import measure, and then measure.label is the first one in here that will actually measure these cells. And we can use the slice explorer and the show plane functions so we can see the what's happening in there. And what's happening in here is that it's getting some, fun, uh, some of these regions that are glued and saying, like, since we can see that they are the same color, so the uh, the label the the label function for us in here is saying, hey, these are the same region, you know. So these three cells that we're seeing here, they are the same region. These two cells that we're seeing in here, they are the same region. This is what label is uh, label is doing right now. So I get I got these two that you can see they're like they're actually apart, but labels will get them and say, hey, um, you know. These two are the same. Um, so if we do, if we make a better segmentation, uh, these will be a region, a region, and the other one will be other regions. So label will see these and say, "Hey, these are apart. These are not the same thing." One of these, one of the segmentations that we can use is the watershed, uh, watershed, watershed segmentation that can then distinguish touching objects according to a local minima. So we pass some markers to it and it starts to expand. And then when it starts to collide, it sees and hey, uh, this is another region. This is not coming from here. This is not us, this is them. So we can use it like passing some, uh, passing some markers according to other functions. First, we will use a distance transform from SciPy. So ND image dot distance, trans distance transform will get the distance uh, of the center of the image up to the, the boundaries of the image. So according to it, you can see uh, where it's brighter in here, it's closer to the center. When it starts to get darker, it's farther from the center. Okay. With that and peak local max, we can uh, generate some markers and pass them to uh, to label for for it to get only the uh, like for it to get regions that we want like separately, um, and then for that we can use circuit image dot feature so a sub module on circuit image that has several, several uh, uh, functions to extract features, uh, functions to extract features, that one was hard, uh, for, from a an input image. So if you want to detect the edges, you can use Kani, uh, you can use like uh, Harry's, Rosenfeld, Shi Tomasi, like to, to detect the corners, like detect blobs, texture, um, detection of objects, peak finding, feature matching, like, uh, and so on. You can do a lot with these, and we need these to use, uh, to get features according to that distance as we just saw. So from scikit image, import feature, and now we can, uh, we can start using that for our segmentation. So we talk about scikit, uh, from, we talked about uh, watershed segmentation, and it lives inside the submodule circuit Im image dot segmentation, right? So several supervised um, uh, supervised segmentations in there, and some unsupervised as well. But um, so the difference is like unsupervised, like no no human input. Supervised, you need to provide some guidance, like some seed points, some initial conditions for it to start uh, to start working. Um, so watershed is here. We're going to use watershed. So segmentation dot watershed it is, and let's import it too. So import segmentation. And we talked about peak local max. So we will pass the distances that we had before from SciPy and get the local maxes from that. And 
establishing a footprint and so on, we will have like the, the, the regions where it will start like getting the maximum, the, the maxima in the, uh, in the, um, the, the regions will, um, in the images we put in there, in the regions it put in there. Okay. And then like according to it, like passing these local maxes, we will get the labels again and, uh, and using, uh, use these as markers for the watershed. Uh, it's a lot, it's a mouthful, but the results are these. Um, it gets some regions, it doesn't get others. So for instance, it's not working that well. And in these regions right here, for instance, you'll see that like it's putting some artifacts in the middle and we don't want that. Um, so again, in here you can see that's like, uh, this is 3D data and maybe you won't see the connections in 2D and here we got lucky. So we see the connections in here and these are supposed to be two cells, but they are giving us one. Uh, and here we have an over segmented label that you can see here, right? So we don't want these two because here right now the algorithm will, uh, will count these as two cells and we don't want that. Um, so why is this happening? Let's first plot the markers we just generated in these images. And then you, um, the plots in here will be, um, will be these, these red, these red labels in here, right? These red dots. And we can see that some cells, you can see this is visibly one cell and it has four markers in it. This one, for instance, uh, for instance, will give one marker and then another marker in here. So it's not working that nicely as we would expect. Um, right. Uh, another example is these, for instance, we have one region, we're seeing one region, but we're giving a lot, uh, a lot of markers in this. So how do we solve this? We will improve it by, by blurring and using a larger footprint in peak local max. So all the code is here, you can check that. Um, and instead of receiving these lots of, uh, lots of markers, we'll just get one. So we see that this region is kind of, um, is kind of skeletonized, you know, like lots of, uh, um, uh, lots of things happening in here and here when we do all, all of these, like, uh, picking local max, some filters, some Gaussian filters, uh, we're smoothing this region and getting only one, uh, only one marker. And now we know that we can pass only these marker. Um, and then we have a nice result in the, in these, we will in this process, lose a little bit of the, uh, the cells that we had in the, uh, in the uh, in the borders but it depends on what you're doing um so for instance there's this uh there's this guy uh ross in like there's this book image processing by ross uh ross or russ 2011 um they say like if you want to count the borders if you're counting the borders on the uh on the the left up you don't count the borders on the right down so you can infer, uh, you can count some, some cells like twice, some images, some, um, some regions twice, or you can just, uh, not count in the, uh, in the borders at all, at all. For us in here, it will be nice. So we can see that's like, these are like, um, entire cells. These are, uh, proper cells and they begin and they end like in, um, um inside the figure right and there you go we have these cells we don't have that many cells that we had in the beginning but we have very nice proper cells right now okay um when we see here um that we clear the border and the uh, the object labels are not sequential anymore Right, so these will be like three, this will be seven, this will be 11, this will be 14 and so on. So we can just relabel uh, sequentially the, uh, this, the, uh, cells, the cells that are there. So 
At the end, we have zero up to eight. So we have eight cells in here. Why, why, are not, why am I not counting zero? Because zero is the background, okay? Um, so we have eight cells in there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, eight cells in there. Okay, so these are well defined. These are well, uh, these are well um, se separated. So we can start uh, measuring these regions, okay? So region props, so measure.region props will give you a lot of properties, but some of these properties won't work for 3D objects. They will work nicely for 2D ones, not for 3D ones. Uh, and right here we have supported properties. These will all work for, for, 3D, for 3D objects. And unsupported properties, these won't work for 3D objects. Eccentricity, moments who, moments weighted who, orientation, perimeters, and perimeter for Crofton. Okay, so measure.regionprops uh, will ignore the label zero, which will represent the background. So we have uh, measure regions, we have one through eight, which are the uh, eight cells. Um, First, let's see the uh, the areas. So the uh, total pixels for all of the uh, for each of these cells are these. Um, so prop dot area for prop in properties will return all the uh, all the areas for all uh, for these are uh, eight objects in there. So uh, forty eight k pixels, forty seven k pixels, forty k pixels, and so on. Um, and then we can just check some statistics and see how these um, how these are behaving, you know, through them. Um, so, for instance, a total of all a total of all pixels that we have in there, we have three hundred and forty five thousand pixels in these. The minimum is the region um, is the cell with thirty seven k pixels and the maximum is the uh, the region with or 48 48k pixels the mean is 43k pixels and the standard deviation is 40 uh like is 4000 pixels okay and of course i was talking to you and hold that thought in the beginning about visualization and since this is live right live presentation and so on you will know that live stuff will always uh, will always breaks whenever you want to present something to somebody. So we have a function in there that's called plot three D surface uh, in the uh, in the uh, the, uh, the the support code. This one will receive a uh, the uh, the three D image with the cells, and then you can point a region, and it will renderize these uh, this cell for you and i wanted to present you all with a full 3d gorgeous interactive plot using itk and itk widgets and guess what surprise surprise it broke yesterday and don't uh don't ask me why i don't know why but i just opened an issue in one of the packages that itk widgets like uh, depends on. So, just for y'all to have an idea on what we're uh, what's happening in there. So this is what we will have in that last image. So these will be nice. This will twist, and you can zoom and you can see these cells and so on. Uh, but I'm sorry, I won't be able to do that today. Um, so if you want to go like beyond that. Uh, on what we saw today. So we have a tour slash guide on the psychic image sub modules, like very complete, like by far, like way, way comp uh, more complete than what we saw today. So we have several gallery examples. You can see the pictures, you can see the code we use to like to generate these. And ITK's IT, uh, ITK widgets, they have their own GitHub. This is, uh, this is what's broke. It's not on them. I believe it's on me, I'm sorry. But you can see how to use it and how to generate these 3D images from ITK inside your Jupyter Notebooks as well. Um, 
So if you'd like what you saw here today, we have our web page, uh, scikit-image.org. I know that Marianne is around, so if you could uh, type our addresses in the uh, in the chat box, I would uh, appreciate that. So scikit-image.org, uh, we have our GitHub repository, uh, scikit-image as well. Um, you can help us like contributing to our code, contributing with documentation, and uh, letting us know how you're using our um, our tool, and we would really appreciate that. So I guess that's it for me. Uh, and thank you, thank you, Rishma, and thank you for the uh, Data Umbrella, uh, the uh, Data Umbrella crew for for giving us the space for this today. Thanks, y'all. Thanks so much, Alex. I'm going to go through a few questions that we have. The first one is. What would you recommend for segmentation and counting of objects in images, for example, numerous cells in an image? Um, I would be I would be a bad person if I would uh, if I didn't say you all uh, depend. It depends. Uh, it depends on the um, it depends on the uh, on the image you got. It depends on how many cells are there it depends on the uh, the filters you can use first so if the uh, the cells are large if the cells are like triangular if the cells are small and so on um there are there are some papers where you can see how we are using psychic image for that so i am i have a paper that we published in 2019 or 2020 i don't i'm not so sure maybe 2020 so I used some uh, some transforms to first filter these. Like we have these uh, these rods, these very small rods, and I used some transforms first to really clean the image. And um, so they were kind of glued together, like we saw in this example. Um, in that, I used watershed, and and then. I used some uh, some segmentation, some algorithm I wrote that's called WUSM. So using um, watershed, using some uh, some uh, several erosions like bonded together. So mostly you will uh, try some pipelines and see what they work for you, like uh, what uh, how they work for you best, you know. But if you can, if you would like to show us your images and uh, see how can uh, you work with uh, how you would work with that on second image. You can come to one of our community calls and we can talk about that, like very specifically, you know. Cool. So I shared a link to the book, which I think might be the one that you were referring to. Is it the Image Processing Handbook, sixth edition by John C. Russ? Yes, that's that. Thank you very much, Reshma. Cool. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the community calls for Scikit Image? Oh yeah, so we're having community calls on Scikit Image on Tuesdays. Um, they they happen very uh, like they happen every week, but every other week they are in different uh, time zones. So in one week you will have Europe slash Africa friendly meetings. So in the middle of the in the middle of the world depending on the map you're you're checking and the other on the other week you will have asia uh asia slash americas um friendly uh friendly hours so if if one week is not suitable for you the other week is uh will be and uh, we have a calendar on the um let me pull the uh, discuss discuss.scientific-python.org and we have a calendar in there where you can see calendars is that it no it's not there scientificpython.org calendars yes so we um there you go scientific python uh scientific-python.org and we have uh, you can you can put these calendars on your like, on your iCal friendly um, 
iCal friendly uh, software, like to check where we're meeting, where we're meeting through Zoom. And we we're there to like answer your questions and see how if you if you are interested in contributing to the project, we're there for you too. Um, and so I'll give the audience a couple of minutes if they have any last minute questions. Um, I I wanted to sort of ask one question, which is what is the um, what is the best way for people to get started in contributing to Sidekit Image? Do you have a range of issues for different levels and experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we um, we right now we are aiming for a uh, our 1.0 version. So we have uh, if you are. Uh, if you have expertise in GitHub Actions, for instance, to take uh, to take care of maintenance stuff, like we we want you there. If you if you can write tutorials and present tutorials, uh, we want you there. Like writing documentation, you can be there too. Like uh, importing, let's say um, a nice, well-known algorithm in in image processing. Like you can import that to like an image. Uh, you can write your own version to a second image to, um, there are, yeah, there are several things you can do. Like in the, if you want to present a nice, Im, uh, a nice example in our gallery, you can do that too. Like, um, yeah, I think there's a lot to do, you know, in several areas. It's not just code. We are very, uh, we're, uh, we're very open for, uh, several parts of, uh, for several forms of communication. Yeah, I just shared the link to the contributing um, that I found how to contribute. So, let's see. And there is a lot of, um, there are a lot, there's a quite a list of things there in, in a way that people can contribute. So that's great. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, oh, sorry, there is one more question, which is what are the image formats that Scikit image can import? So, um, I'd say there's it will work with most of the well-known uh, image formats. If you're dealing with a um, a like um, different, let's say not exquisite image formats or something different, if it's well supported by NumPy, you can use it in Scikit Image. If it's well supported by SciPy, you can use it in Scikit Image. Um, so, for instance. I PNG like uh, PNG JPEG TIFFs everything can work in there like uh, you can use uh, Zara images because NumPy NumPy works with them and so on like yeah if if there is something you would like to use in Scikit Image and we don't support it we will try to great and so I have another question what's the best way for the community to get in touch with scikit image so for example is there is do you use a discourse or so we um if you want to if you want to get in touch face by face we have our community calls as we say if you have an issue with scikit image you can go towards github right uh in our github you can open an issue and we have our forum like a forum image dot sc is that it um forum dot image dot s uh, sc so if you want some help on how to use second like, image for like general general things and you don't want to be there and talk to us about that like uh oh i cannot wait until tuesday so you can post your uh your code and your questions in this forum image dot sc or our discourse uh, discuss dot scientific dash python dot org that has a section on uh, on Sakit image as well. Where uh, our we maintainers are in these places. Great, and I have one more question, which is: Is Sakit image participating in Hacktoberfest? Yes, uh, yes, we are. So if you if you have something you want to contribute and if you want to be part of Hacktoberfest, I I think we are there this uh, this year. I have to check, but we are uh, we used to be a part of that. 
great. I'm just um, copying some of these links. What I'll do is I will link to all of these resources that you're putting in the chat once I post the videos. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you, Reshma. And I think I just have one last question, which is uh, a lot of community questions that I have for you. Um, High Data Global Online is in December, I believe. Are you or anybody from the project participating in that in terms of um, either presenting or they have the online sprints as well some years? I don't know if they're having it this year. Not that I know of, but very likely. Uh, if you can meet, send me that later, Reshma, and <laughs> then we can talk about that. Okay, I will do that. All right, okay, so we have no other questions. So thank you, Alex, so much for um, presenting. Um, I will have the video up within a day. Usually it happens. Um, apologies for the people who joined late. Uh, it looks like our link is, um, I, we have to update our link. Um, Big Marker changes some stuff around. So we'll, we'll take care of that for future events. And with that, I will um, end the recording.